All right, guys, the first time we're going to try this out, and uh, I hope you're having a good day. I'm up here on a beautiful Saturday at school working, so I hope you'll have a good weekend and had a good weekend. And, uh, yeah, I'll leave some time on the Edpuzzle to show your good things. All right, so um, we're going to get started on the theory of evolution. One thing we have to get clear is that what is the theory of evolution up against, or what it's, um, what is the opposite or the contrast to it, and why is it relevant? Um, and and we not understand to uh, question the philosophical reasons behind anybody's point, but because we have to understand where the developers and the scientists behind the theory where it started. And so either you have the theory of evolution, or you have creation. And again, that's not a specific religious. Um, destination, that is the theory. There's several religions. There's religions that don't believe in creation. There's religions that are atheistic. Um, so there's different versions. And so it's not just one religious group that this is opposed against. It's just a, it's creation that it's opposed against. So, and yeah. So we'll go ahead and get started. All right. We're going to start with a question. Um, to think about this. So we walk into a classroom, a candle's burning, none of us there when the candle was lit. Um, can we figure out how long the candle was burning? I'll give you all some time to think about that. So some of your ideas may be, okay, we can see how long the candle burns per hour. Or somebody may have the idea, we can measure the amount of wax. Um, some of the issues with those are, so the first one, can't even bring power. Yes, we can measure how long the candle melts over a period of time, but the issue is that is we, we don't know how big the candle was originally because candles come in all forms, shapes, and sizes, right? Um, with the amount of candle in the wax, what happens to the wax? Does all the wax melt? No, right? Some of that wax evaporates, so that won't work. Um, yeah, let me know in the comments if y'all can uh, come up with something else, but so far, uh, yeah, there's, there's no possible way with us actually determining how long the candle, we can learn a lot of things about the candle, but we can never learn how long the candle is actually burning. All right, so this brings us to the fossil record. All right, the fossil record was um, developed by Sir Charles Lyell in um, the 1800s. Um, he was a Scottish lawyer. He wrote the book Principles of Ge Geology. Um, he was a predecessor to Darwin. Okay. Um, here is his the cover of his book. This is open source. You can get online. You can look it up. You can find it on a website. You have a little book. Um, he wrote this in 1830. Uh, I would have had a quote for you guys from this book, but uh, half this book is anti-religious um, against Christianity. And to sit there and pick out a quote from this would have been to sit there and defend Christianity, not just you know. It, it's weird to show that he. His motives behind writing his book, um, and, it, and so you know, I always tell you guys think about the difference between a hypothesis, theory, and a law, um, and and judge your biases. Be be upfront about your biases. Okay, so this would be one example of the fossil record, right? You'll see pictures. You can go dig holes, and you see geologists, and they'll have just layer after layer. Um, you can see the distinctive layers of different bands of colors, right? Well, how do they figure out the um, the age of each layer is they look at the fossils present in that layer. So as we see with the different, um, these, are, these guys right here, uh, I should highlight this. Sorry. these guys right here, these are different types of trilobites, right? Um, and so it would, if you were looking for a bone and you found a bone and next to that bone or in that same layer of the earth as that bone, you found these trilobite fossils. You'd say, okay, well, we can use this trilobite fossil. This, These trilobites right here, they date from somewhere between for 407, yeah, 417 million years to 350 million years. And so there's different um, organisms put forth. We'll talk about them specifically, what we call index species. Um, but that gives us the layers. And so if I want to know the age of a layer, I look at the fossils in that layer. Okay. Um, this is another image. This is actually from Lyle's book of the fossil, um, the geological column. Um, Okay, um, as you can see, what you see from the bottom of the picture, right? Um, you see um, 
you describe the organisms as you go up, you, you see a larger diversity of organisms at the top, right? Um, you also see simpler looking organisms, right? Less structures, uh, a little bit more simple, less figures. Um, Y'all know about any of these organisms versus a worm or a sponge, real simple. Um, snails, mollusks, um, uh, predecessors to crustaceans, those trilobites. Um, and as you go up, as you go up the column, you see that didn't work. As you go up the column, um, it increases in complexity, right? Um, you see. Okay, here's another example of the fossil record with more detail. Um, these, uh, what's called, like a ram horn, ram, ram's horn shell. Let's see, how many of them are there? Yeah, four. Um, these are all specific index species. So we see our trilobites again, right? Now we've got these, what's, what are called amyonites. All right, we'll talk about them. And then you got different type, types of mussels and clams, other sh shells um, that are widely found. Um, these are what we, yeah, again, these are all index fossils um, and that we use to determine the, the zone. Okay, we also use these to um, distinguish a gradual evolution between organisms and put forth the idea of a gradual increasing in diversity of the organisms. Okay, so and along with that, what we actually call those, when we see that di gradual diversity and that similarities, we call those homologies, right? What does homo mean? Same. Okay, and logies is represented to the anatomy. Okay, so there's three types of homologies. There's anatomical, there's molecular, and there's developmental. So take a moment and look at the different models shown to us and what are some of the things you've learned from these models. Remember, think, think small pieces, you know, and then put them together. So details and conclusions like. So we see that these are in, each one of these images is an image of a limb from four different organisms, right? They're all mammals. Um, and even by the color, we can determine how the model is trying to show us the similarities in bone structures. So like the femurs, or uh, not the femur, but the, um, the femurs in your leg, this is in your arm, but um, of each one. Uh, the radius in the ulna um, and how each one of these mammals have it, even though their limbs are different shapes, but shows a, a homologous, homology, sorry guys, of these organisms. And this would be an anatomical homology. We'll come back later on to uh, molecular and developmental homologies. Okay, let's keep going. So let's talk about some issues with the fossil record. All right, the first, and the largest issue is, um, well, we'll talk about one example, not the largest issue, but trilobites, right? So this is a, a trilobite fossil, um, okay, somewhere between 500 to 600 million years ago, right? Okay, um, can you tell what this is? If you look around the outside of the image, right, that's a shoe print. And right here, okay, this is the mold of the shoe print, we can actually see a trilobite fossil, all right, that has been crushed, okay, by a shoe print. So, uh, yeah, think about that. Um, yeah, and I forgot to say earlier, and I'll say it now. My job here is to get you guys to evaluate and analyze the theory of evolution, okay? So, as we go through these things, I'm going to tell you a little bit about them, and then I'm going to give you all some other issues with the, the theory, and leave it up to y'all so you guys can analyze and evaluate the validity of this theory and where maybe this theory needs to be tweaked or maybe this theory needs to be set aside you know let's keep going all right again another example of those crushed trilobites um Have any questions about the sources of some of these stuff? I mean, I've got. Yeah. There you go. There's a theory. It was the aliens, right? Yeah, they showed up 500 million years ago. Yep. No. No. The ancients were not aliens, guys. All right, none of that. Let me watch the Discovery Channel. Let's keep going. 
Um, here's an example. So trilobites we saw earlier in those one picture, you got tiny trilobites, you've got huge trilobites, okay? Um, your trilobites, um, all your crustaceans, you everybody know, remember isopods, your little roly polies that you have at the house and you pick up a rock and they're, they're decaying debris. Um, those are the ancestors, the trilobites are their ancestors. Okay, those are modern day trilobites, really what they are. Um, but here's something about the trilobites. So part of Sir Lyle's theory was, right, you had real simple organisms at the bottom and in increasing complexity, right? So if you look here, um, what do we have? We have statements by um, different scientific uh, magazines, right, uh, quoting articles. Um, the most, most sophisticated eye ever produced in nature. Um, that, kind of, that kind of kicks that in the shoulders with uh, Lyle's theory that he put forth. Um, if we look, this is a in picture of a trilobite eye. Okay, and so we see the amazing complexity um, and the diversity how it functions and it works. Um, if you look, at it kind of does look like, an, like a fly sometimes, but there's a little bit different complexity to it. Okay, amazing. Um, here's some different uh, structures of trilobites. Okay, from fossils. Um, all right, here's another issue. Okay, you can tell what these are, right? Living trilobites. These are deep sea isopods. Okay. Um, found in the Gulf of Mexico, right? Um, yeah, these are these are trial bites, guys. So the question here is, is if the fossil record was developed to say, okay, if I find this fossil in this age range, that, that they only existed at this certain time, well, like, but they still exist, right? Um, so there's kind of an issue here with those index species, but we'll come back to that. So this, this is just one example, right? Okay, ammonites, right? Um, this fossil and this image of this fossil is kind of funny. It's actually upside down. Um, and you'll see how it's upside down in a minute. All right, these ammonites, um, they're not snails, all right? They're actually cephalopods, which are your octopus, squids, um, all your invertebrates that have a complex brain and tentacles typically. And they actually do have some bony structures, the ammonites, bony structures on the inside, the beak of octopus and squids on the inside, okay? Where the ammonites are on the outside. I think I said that backwards, but. Anyways, all right, so ammonites, index fossil, right, most abundantly, right? All right, let's go. All right. at this point, I want to show you guys a video of a nautilus um, and see what it is. You can see it on the next slide, um, but the videos in this editing and presentation will not play both the recording and the video. So at this point, what you need to do, and then you'll have to do this three other times, two other times, is you will have to open up the... Google Docs, and it's got three links, and they're in order. And there's a fourth link for an optional, a little bit more explanation on Luis Pastor's experiment. But so yeah, at this point, go ahead, pause the video, and go to, and open it up on YouTube and watch that video. It'll be a pretty interesting link. Okay. Now here's a picture.